So um, with technical issues, I think finally dealt with, um, or at least I hope finally dealt with, um, I can now um, properly welcome Hannah. Uh, thanks for your patience, Hannah. Um, and thank you very much for um, being willing to, to give this our fifth ENSEL seminar. Um, we are once again jumping continent um, from Asia back to Europe. And the, um, the talk that you're about to give is a development of your uh, work has been ongoing since your doctoral studies, as, um, as I understand. Um, so you're, you, you're a researcher that um, completed your DPhil at the University of Sussex and since then have moved to the University of the Basque Country, though you're still a visiting um, researcher at Sussex, isn't that right? Yeah. Um, and you have given the um, inactive literature along with Ezekiel de Palo the whole concept of participatory sense making, which has become really a foundation point for an entire stream of research within inactive thinking um, and forms the foundation for our whole approach to understanding social interaction. And in your um, recent in your recent publications, the movement has gone from um, the speaking about the cognitive science of interaction to the cognitive science of intersubjectivity. And that notion of intersubjectivity has become increasingly important in your work, which is something I've, um, as I've mentioned to you before, I found um, particularly compelling. Um, so the talk um, that we will see today is you're going to present um, some, a, a conversation that you had in essence with um, a neuroscientist regarding participatory sense making and in particular the notion of the interactive brain hypothesis. Now I suppose I'll leave the, the description of the actual theory to you. Um, but without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll invite you to um, begin the talk and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining. Um, I hope it works to, I should just switch to full screen on my keynote, right? Yeah, as you said, I will be presenting a dialogue that I had at a conference and I will explain a little bit how that came about because, um, yeah, uh, what I will talk about in the in this presentation is just Really briefly, in two slides, I will explain a little bit about participatory sense making or just recap the main points in a way. Um, and then I will also mention some of these recent and ongoing developments that you also mentioned, Marek. Um, just to mention, yeah, in which uh, fields the concept or, or the theory has, you know, is being tested and being further developed. And then I will present this dialogue on the interactive brain hypothesis and social neuroscience, which I had with Ralph Adels and Ezekiel Di Paolo. Um, Ezekiel is, of course, also listening. So, um, and then I will also present some implications for research in social neuroscience, but that won't be very detailed, actually. But yeah, you will see that will I will do that in the concluding section. Um, so participatory sense making is all about how uh, people in interaction are all sent people who who meet each other are all sense makers as we define it in um, an active theory um, so they are self-organizing uh, systems who can um, through this self-organization and through adaptivity as Ezekiel uh, defined it in in his 2005 paper on uh, adaptivity who can also regulate their interactions with the world and this diagram as we all know it is uh, comes of course from the tree of knowledge by Maturana and Varela um, and which, when such sense makers um, who uh, yeah when they interact with each other um, we propose that they also enter into an interactive system which is again itself also an autonomous system a self-organizing system with many of the similar properties of autonomous systems as, as uh, living systems although not all but that that's um yeah i think there is still some work to do on the details there but in any case um individuals as self-organizing systems are precarious and so are um, social interactions so it's it's a kind of um a vulnerable process as well 
And so what participatory sense making is about um, is not just how individuals behave in interaction and what the interaction itself as a process contributes to how individuals behave and how they make sense of each other. Um, it's also that the fact that this happens in a social and historical context, um, although yeah, the, the conceptualization of, of how this works is being developed at the moment. Um, so participatory sense making is about how intersubjectivity uh, is basically the interplay between interactive and individual autonomy and sense making to just put it very briefly with many technical terms that have a lot of background in the inactive uh, framework, of course. But it's in, in more lay terms, maybe it's about how social agents literally participate in each other's sense making. So as sense makers, we are continually moving around in the world. And when we meet other people and interact with other people, we move with them in a way and because movement and uh, our situatedness are so central to how we make sense when we move with other people we can participate in each other's sense making and hence um, understand each other or understand things together as we move and um, or work or dance or speak together um, so participatory sense making has been um, you know is, is, a, is meant to be a kind of framework for studying social understanding within an inactive um, within the inactive theory so if it's a proposal like that it should be possible to conceptualize it further and to test it and to apply it uh, and this has been happening in many different areas for instance uh, people have thought about music and participatory sense making and an active concepts of life uh, for instance um, uh, yeah there are so many people working on all these things I can't even name all the all the people involved and maybe I should mention nobody then nobody else so feels left out because really I mean I don't want to um, mention some names and not others but people are working on all these different aspects they're being developed at the moment and also there are some criticisms which uh, yeah uh, some of them are from the inactive uh, perspective and some of them are from without and they kind of som sometimes people try to criticize participatory sense making from um, um, a more traditional cognitive cognitivist or individualist uh, perspective and then they don't really um, they kind of ask us to uh, speak within the logic of cognitivist individualist approaches and they don't really acknowledge that an activism has a different log logic its own specific logic if you like and this is also an, a theme that it would be nice to develop further um, but people have been working on on object perception ezekiel has um, is there's a um, paper going to appear by him in the journal of consciousness uh, journal of consciousness studies yes on how object perception is um interactive now i did mention one name <laughs> um uh people work on psychopathology on the dynamics of interacting on all different kinds of therapy uh which is an ethics which is also important i think it's not just about conceptualizing and making the theory into hypothesis for empirical sciences or uh, to be applied in different fields, but it's also about application in, in the real world, I think. And there, of course, we, we relate to existing forms of therapy. And then I also have to mention Marek, actually, <laughs> as one other person. Um, he, yes, I, I think um, we talked about it last week, Marek, um, this, this uh, topic of the role of the environment in social cognition and of behavior settings. It would be really nice to, yeah, know more because i think this issue of behavior settings and i put it in quotation marks because it's a technical term um yeah it i think it would be very helpful to to think about how to make it uh, empirically testable um perhaps with the behavior settings uh and politics yeah there are some people work and there's someone in canada working on um um how first nations people um, conceive of their relationship with the, with the land and how they speak about this and how their way of speaking is very different from how government speak uh, government speaks about this and how yeah if we would be look be able to look through an active lens at this kind of dialogue we might be able to um, 
facilitate the dialogue between First Nations people and the Canadian government. So yeah, lots of interesting things are happening. Um, and all of this um, is about turning inactive concepts into domain-specific claims, hypotheses, and explanations. And in this talk, I'm going to speak about one particular effort to do this. Um, and this happened in um, Finland last year um, at a conference uh, organized by Rita Hari and her lab, the, the people working in her lab. Um, and this picture is from the lake where the conference took place. It was a very beautiful um, surroundings, was very nice. Um, and so the conference was called Attending and Neglecting People. Um, and it is part of a series on attention and performance, which has been going on for many, many years. Um, and a special issue on the basis of this conference will appear in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, Biological Sciences. Um, what happened at the conference is that, um, uh, yeah, actually what th this dialogue is about, what can the interactive brain hypothesis mean for social neuroscience? Um, and the way it came about is that Ralph Adels was one of the people speaking at the conference. Um, and he had recently published a paper called the unsolved problems of neuroscience um, in, I think it, it appeared in ticks. And he has a number of questions uh, for the, yeah, the, the questions that are still open for neuroscience. And um, in a nutshell, he says that the biggest unsolved problems of neuroscience is how the brain generates the mind. And he also said in that paper that we can perfectly well ask about cognition and computation without asking about subjective experience. Although one would hope that a full understanding of cognition and computation might eventually explain subjective experience. And um, just before going to that conference, I noticed that Evan Thompson had um, published on, um, I think, Psychology Today, which is a, a popular website, um, a kind of criti critique of this um, article by Ralph, where he says that asking how the brain generates the mind may not be the right question. And of course, he, he would turn the question around and say that we should ask how the brain facilitates the mind and think first about meaning, meaning and subjectivity and then about the role of the brain in that uh, from, from understanding subjectivity and meaning. And so I started my presentation at the conference, or I, I intended to start my presentation at the conference from this, uh, from Ralph's uh, paper and then Evan's critique of it. Um, but before I gave my presentation, I, by, co by coincidence, I sat across from Ralph at lunch and I told him about this. And then um, that started a series of conversations that we had over lunch in which he wanted to know more about my about these kinds of criticisms of his of, of neuroscience actually of, and of, in particular of social neuroscience because i I thought that there were also no questions about intersubjectivity or social cognition in Ralph's article, which I found strange because he of course works a lot on on uh, social his field is social neuroscience and emotional emotion neuroscience so um, yeah I, and we had yeah, one of the things I want to convey maybe with this presentation is uh, something about how these interdisciplinary dialogues come about. You know, it can be something like that, meeting someone at a conference and actually having Evan Thompson's um, article gave me the courage to start speaking to Ralph about this and to, to um, yeah. And, and he, Ralph was very open to this and he, he really took the question seriously, even though he was puzzling a lot with, um, but if so, he, he said basically, I understand all your uh, concerns, and but I what can I do as a neuroscientist with these concerns? How can I deal with them? And what would it mean for social neuroscience to take these things seriously? Um, and so, from that kind of um, open and um, like looking the problem straight in, into the eyes approach, we had several conversations. And so um, this turned out to be a dialogue in which uh, Ezekiel also took a large part in the end because um, we wrote the interactive brain hypothesis paper, but the, the 
technical aspects, let's say, or the, des the descriptions of the experiments and, and the, the empirical research. And those are more Ezekiel's work. So in the end, we decided to write it between the three of us. Um, and so um, the dialogue is about the interactive brain hypothesis and, and some of Ralph's objections against it and then our, our defense of this. And then um, what, we, what social neuroscience can take from this dialogue. Um, some, some, some suggestions it can take. So the interactive brain hypothesis says that social interaction processes play enabling and constitutive roles in the development and in the ongoing operations of brain mechanisms that are involved in social cognition, whether the person is engaged in an interactive situation or not. Um, so uh, this, we illustrated this with the perceptual like, cross, uh, crossing experiment by uh, Malika Ouvre and Charles René and, and their colleagues, um, in which two people interact. Um, uh, they are situated in, in, or they interact via a computer. They cannot see each other or hear each other. Um, and they interact with objects in a virtual world, who you, which you can see here on the line on, on the top of this diagram. I, unfortunately, I can't use my um, mouse as a pointer, but they encounter these objects in the virtual world. Um, and two of these objects move around and they are, um, one of them is their own avatar, so to speak, and the other one is the uh, shadow of their avatar. Um, and they, yeah. Um, when when a participant encounters an, an, a moving object, um, uh, or when they encounter any object in the world, the only thing that they uh, they don't see this object. They just. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm messing this up. It's because there are um, there's building going on next door, and I, I uh, yeah, I'm a bit confused by that by the noise from that. But anyway. Um, Maybe I don't need to explain the experiment too much in detail. What the point is, is that um, this experiment in our view shows that social interactions aren't just inputs to a cognitive system, but uh, that we need to take into account both individual and interactive mechanisms. Um, and in the experiment, this is shown because the solution to the problem, um, to, to the task, the performance on the, on the task that is asked of the participants is done by the interactive um, um, dynamics. So social interactions are at the basis of social skills and of social brain functioning. Um, and so we take from this a research guideline, if you like, uh, which is to specify which social events and social relations and brain activity matter to particular instances of social cognition and how they matter. Um, so Ralph's objections against this proposal uh, are in terms of three different things. One thing was he, he kept saying that um, for him, what was important seemed to be the ca causal density. So he, he uh, said that the internal connections in the brain, there are many, many, many more of them than uh, connections between the brain and the environment. Um, and he made a big point of that. It, it was um, yeah, obviously important. Um, and I questioned that because I thought, you know, um, yeah, there's also such a thing as Occam's razor. And we had discussions about this, but I will tell in a moment about what, what our defense is against this um, this idea that the, the number of connections is, is, is the most important me metric. Um, another problem that he had, or, or um, a question that he had was, how then do we partition this system? Um, of course, from the classical model of cognitive science, um, we speak about input and processing and output. And the main thing that happens is the processing in the middle, in the brain. And the input and output are just, yeah, like like he said, sparsely connected to the brain, and so all the meat is in the middle. Um, and also, uh, in order to speak about cognition, he thought we should um, make a, dis the, a division between behavior and computation and consciousness. Um, and we can speak about behavior, and, and that is a certain thing. Then computation or reprocessing is another aspect, and consciousness is another one. 
Um, and all of them together form cognition. But um, we need all of them in order to be able to speak about cognition. Um, and so, yeah, in the inactive model, of course, we speak about the whole system that matters. And uh, this means all the elements and all their interactions. And if we t speak about social cognition or social understanding, then, of course, we say that the, the whole system as it exists spanning the two people or three people who, who interact, this in itself is also, um, yeah, is, is contributes to cognition. So he was wondering about how to partition the, all these things, how to pull them apart and what is doing the cognitive work here. And then his worry was, what, yeah, what, what is the place for social neuroscience? If I take into account all, the, all of the comments that you make and all the, these ideas, then then where is social neuroscience? Does it still exist as a discipline uh, in itself? Won't it dissolve? Um, and so he thought that in the perceptual crossing experiment, um, we can say that each person's brain is processing information and that, um, and that this is probably what contributes most to the, to the result. And yes, there is a unique behavior of this whole system. Um, of the two people interacting with each other, but that he called only a behavior. Uh, so this, um, the behavior of the both participants finding each other's uh, avatar, um, he says, yes, that's, that's a unique behavior, but it's not yet cognition because there's no conscious experience as part of this and also no uh, inter-individual uh, processing. So he wouldn't call that cognition. Um, so, in response to his uh, questions, we said that um, the dynamical processes involved in social interactions, um, that is bodily processes, relational processes between participants and also with their surroundings, they can be constitutive, a constitutive part of social understanding. So this is a possibility. We propose it as a possibility, but, but we of course believe that it's more than a possibility, that it's in fact quite plausible and very widespread. So that the um, re revising the idea of social cognition in an inactive sense um, means to take, into, to take as one of the basic elements the, the dynamical process of, in, of social interaction. And so um, the first uh, way to argue against um, um, the, the idea that most of it is happening in the individual is to point to entanglement or non-decomposability and interaction dominance in systems. So if you, in, in several hyper-scanning um, experiments where two people are scanned at the same time, and here in this investigation it's done with EEG, um, when people are, uh, in this one particularly, asked to um, make hand movements um, just freely and to maybe synchronize each other's hand movements, um, what happens in the brain is that there is a synchronization at the alpha, the beta, and the gamma uh, levels, and these are uh, the, the gamma level is much um, much faster than uh, the movement um, synchronizes. So how is that possible? It, it's probably only possible because um, the system here is in, is interaction dominant and the um, uh, the, the brains of the two people um, are synchronized because uh, the interaction makes that happen rather than that they are individually uh, separate. Um, and the second one is that uh, social interaction has functional roles. So in the, in the perceptual crossing experiment, each participant inputs, uh, in, it's the input that each participant gets from an object is ambiguous. So as they encounter an object in the environment, the only thing they receive um, in order to indicate that they are, that, that they are uh, being, that there is a stimulus from an object in the environment is a tap on the finger. And it's this, exactly the same for each of the objects that the participant can encounter in the environment. So on the basis of that input, the, each participant cannot distinguish the difference between different objects. So disambiguating the stimuli is done only through the interaction process. Um, 
And so solving this task is done in large part by the collective dynamics and not by the individual um, participants. And so solving a cognitive task, if it's a matter of, of making an ambiguous stimulus into a non-ambiguous one, in this process, it's only in, in this experiment, the perceptual crossing experiment, it's only done by the interaction process. And so that means that the interaction process forms part of solving this um, social question, this of performing this social task. Um, and third, um, there is also irreducibility. So many things that we do socially um, cannot be completed by one person on their own, um, such, such as, for instance, a greeting. If you greet someone but they haven't seen you or they they return a blank face, then the greeting isn't completed. There is no greeting. And the same goes for giving and receiving something. You cannot um, do that just as one person. And, and another example of that is escalation. So um, um, in an experiment by Shergill and colleagues, um, people were asked to um, push on each other's hands uh, in turns and um, uh, to always push with the same force as they perceived the other person giving in the previous turn. But this behavior escalated. So from turn to turn, the force um, became stronger between that, that each person applied. And this is an example of escalation where either, e even if each individual doesn't think that they are applying more force in each turn, um, overall the system um, tends towards the use of more force um, between each other. And this, of course, is something that uh, Gregory Bateson has looked at as well when he talked about schismogenesis and, and feedback, um, which it, escalation is something that often um, it's, it's out of the control of individuals and it's often um, associated with a negative affect. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a process that kind of runs on its own between people and neither person intends it, but somehow in the end, you end up with, with um, yeah, um, negative affect and sometimes also negative behaviors. Um, so Ra Ralph's response to this, um, which is also reported in the paper, of course, uh, the paper is forth forthcoming in that special issue. Um, he, I, I was really um, impressed by, by his openness and by his, uh, yeah, the way his, his, um, his, 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 he was open to opening up his thinking, if you like. So this, this question of him about what is cognition, um, in a way, in this paper, neither of us, um, Ezekiel and I or Ralph, define cognition very precisely. But of course, the, there is a strong connection between how you define cognition and what is the explanatory domain. So um, if you ex start to explain cognition and in particular social understanding um, by including also interactive elements, then um, the explanatory dom domain changes and also maybe the disciplines um, which are investigating this. So the role of the brain is not just in the individual's head in isolation, but in interactions with the body, the world and others. And then you have to, of course, redefine cognition and also the, uh, yeah, what, what you can explain with it. And then also he started to wonder if causal density is really the best way to think about it. And I think we convinced him that um, maybe it's not. <laughs> um, and maybe he would like to speak more um, about manipulability, so um, about um, yeah, whether an individual, whether we as scientists can manipulate the, the phenomenon uh, that happens uh, when we define it as just happening in the brain in, in isolation or when we, def when we look at it in interaction. But also he referred to evolution and development um, and thinking about where evolution can do its work. Um, and of course that happens, yeah, in the organism, but uh, yeah. In any case, he, he, in this paper, some thoughts were changed, which was nice. And in a way also what we wanted to do with this um, 
um, work is to uh, open up this dialogue further. So we didn't aim to um, reconceptualize uh, quite strictly any of these issues, but rather to open a dialogue between the different approaches and to ask further questions. And so suggestions for social neuroscience that came out of this are, um, well, you might, this is, this mouse is there because um, Ralph referred to a piece of research in using optogenetics in which um, researchers were able to um, stimulate the brain in such a way, in the, in the same way that it would have been, would have uh, worked if there would have been a, a real sensory stimulus. So they replaced a sensory stimulus in, as it is taken up in the brain by um, um, an, an, a gen, an input that they generated, which was, an exact, what was, which was exactly the same. But of course, if you do that um, in, an inter, in an interaction, if you want to model um, how two mice interact or two social agents interact, then you can't do this anymore because the behavior of one of the mice is always um, determined by the other one turn by turn in their interactions. And so you cannot um, model aspects of a, of a social interaction by modeling only one side. You always have to have one, two side, both sides because they mutually influence each other continually. Um, and so the interactive brain hypothesis is precisely a hypothesis. It's not a claim. So um, it's a, something that is meant to serve um, to generate further research and to be tested, to be put to the test. And so it's about the irreducibility of the interaction and it is situated within the wider framework of inaction. So it's not just about um, the interaction being important, but also about what individuals do in terms of sense making um, and uh, a theory of meaning that is behind this as well, meaning as a relational uh, activity, uh, relational and situated activity. So for social neuroscience, the implication um, to Ralph's question of now what to do with social neuroscience, what can I do as a social neuroscience scientist? I think um, we came to the conclusion that social neuroscience has a problem when it tries to explain all that, all that underlies behavior and cognition. When, in, in other words, when it thinks that it has um, every answer to this and that the whole answer will be found in the brain. Um, so, uh, in a way, social neuroscience would probably be helped or, or could uh, change its explanatory dom domain a bit. And if it's seen as uh, part of a larger endeavor and includes input from domains that study social interaction. And then um, what can be done is to investigate the factors that contribute to the self-organization of interaction processes. And this can, can be found, for example, in um, microsociology or interactional sociology and conversational analysis, and mainly also the work of um, Irving Goffman. Um, and also uh, social neuroscience can think about, can think in terms of how the precariousness or vulnerability of individual participants and the precariousness and or vulnerability of the interaction process interplay with each other. And these, um, these two aspects are things that uh, are also appearing in that special issue of the, of, uh, that results from the conference, where I work together with Ansi Perikola and uh, Melissa Stivanovic, who are um, interactional sociologists. And we thought about um, which, which are the uh, aspects of coordination um, that contribute to the self-organization of social interactions, both in terms of um, microsociology or interactional sociology. So these are things like turn taking and uh, uh, co-presence between people. And on the other hand, we uh, I listed there some aspects of coordination as we understand it in an action. And then we yeah, we also talked about how both individuals and interactor and, and interaction processes are um, if you like precarious and how they interplay with each other is something that um, yeah, should be studied. And social neuroscience, yeah, can uh, contribute to that by looking at the dynamics of this in terms of um, uh, non-decomposability 
and, intera and, and interaction dominance and which uh, aspects or which factors play a role in that. Um, and that's all. Thank you. That's great, Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, so I, as we um, sort of move to the discussion section, I'm just going to um, quickly post the uh, just a couple of, of um, in sort of hints there, or instructions for, as um, I said just before Hannah's talk, we had um, people have had a little bit of um, difficulty in activating the question and answers app that's available within the Google on Hangouts, the Google, uh, the Hangout on Air forum uh, format. Uh, but in the top right of your browser there, there should be a small apps icon. And if you click that, the Q&A app should be there and activatable um, by you. And if um, that being the case, then you should be able to type questions for Hannah um, and also vote up questions um, that will um, it's sort of that, that you see other people typing. So we've had some um, mixed success with that in the past. We're hoping um, the difficulty was primarily just due to the difficulty in actually finding the app to activate it. Um, the the interface that um, the chair and speaker have can be a little bit different to that that a lot of the users. So we were a little bit slow getting started because of technical difficulties. And um, thanks to both viewers and particularly to Hannah for hanging around. Um, I think we it would be nice to to get a few questions in if we can. So we we'll give the audience just a a little bit of time to um, uh, type in a few questions and maybe. Uh, communicate um, a couple of possibilities. But the option for further discussion is always available on the ENSO Seminars website as well, ensoseminars.com, uh, where there will be a, an online discussion that um, is sort of more discussion forum based and therefore um, can be sort of handled in a, a, in a sort of less synchronous fashion, I suppose. Um, so Hannah, I was, thanks for for the talk. Um, I, I really like the, uh, the interactive brain hypothesis largely because of the, the point that you made towards the end, which is taking in active ideas and forming more concrete testable hypotheses from them. Um, I think uh, the active approach in general has um, moved perhaps slower than many people would have liked on that front. Um, I know I find it very difficult um, to develop those kinds of concepts and develop an empirical research um, agenda. Um, I'm just I'm very curious about the the dialogue you had um, with Ralph Edels as well, and as to so it sounds like it, it he was very open, um, mm -hmm. and certainly in the uh, the suggestions that you've uh, had that he he sort of left open the possibility that. Um, we had an inadequate definitions of cognition and that um, his initial intuitions about things like causal density um, might not capture the kinds of things that he really wanted to capture. I'm just curious as to found, given the the whole notion of participatory sense-making and the, the participatory experience of that kind of back and forth with someone with a different theoretical viewpoint, whether it either sharpened up your understanding or your way of thinking about more traditional um, mainstream social neuroscience, or whether, in fact, it, it um, sharpened up your understanding of inactive, the inactive approach and your own understanding of the interactive brain hypothesis, actually. <laughs> That's a wonderful question. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, of course, it, yes. Uh, one of the things that I, that I find um, something that keeps coming back in my own thinking now, um, increasingly these days, is actually maybe not so much related to that dialogue precisely, in terms that it didn't come from there, um, but it's relevant to it and to many of the developments I think that are going on with participatory sense making, and that is that the interactive brain hypothesis is not only about, um, I mean, you, you could it, it, it has a weak form, which is that we, we change through interactions and therefore um, the social skills as we have them and generate them and, and, and um, learn them throughout life uh, influence how, what our brain is like and how the brain functions in social situations. But in the stronger form, it's about how um, interaction influences here and now um, 
what goes on in the brain, even when we are not in an interactive situation. Um, and so when we, are, when we may be um, observing interaction or when we are thinking about another person, still then interactive skills are important. And for that, I think a, a really um, interesting issue is what we call in, in the paper with Elena Kufari uh, and Ezekiel on language um, or languaging. Behavior, languaging. We call the primordial tension between, that is always there uh, for social agents in a way, in that uh, they're always um, um, in a relation with others, or, or rather the primordial tension is actually about how we are always um, in, a in, in an interaction with an interactive situation. So we are always, even when another person isn't present, we are, um, um, yeah, I only have the Dutch word now in my head for this. <laughs> we are always behaving towards an interactive situation. So even when another person isn't present, we are in a way, um, um, yeah, we're still socially embedded, even if there isn't another agent immediately present. Yeah, and so participatory sense making seems to be quite pervasive, um, even when an other is only virtual. So when I'm, you know, maybe I'm doing something, and in a way, my mother is influencing me because of uh, our interactional history that we have. Um, and this is also always an ongoing thing. It's something that is not really completely set in stone, even though. Uh, you know, some influences in our life may be quite, um, yeah, uh, fixed in some ways, but actually the, the interaction that you have with that interaction with your mother is always ongoing and always um, changing. Of course, not continually with your mother, but different interaction, interactions that you have with different people are always at play somewhere when you are you know, doing things. It's a, that, that notion of the interaction continues even in the absence of the, the specific actions of a, of a given agent. It, sort of, um, it strikes me the, um, just that the notion of inertia seems to capture a lot there, that um, any given social dynamic, and in particular from what you're saying there as well, habitual ones, um, just have an inertia to them. You don't, they're not sort of necessarily um, written in stone, they're not fixed and rigid, but you don't get to sort of ignore them or put them aside and do something else either. They're, they're sort of, uh, they have a certain momentum that yeah. you have to work with. And you, I suppose we can, if we're, um, uh, if we're good at what we do and good at interacting with other people, then that momentum often works in our favor and we can help, you know, use that, that inertia to um, help get things done. But in many situations, um, the, our, our actions are much more constrained by it, I suppose. Yeah. So in terms then of the, the, um, the implications for the actual um, social neuroscience that you touched on at the end, is there a way, basically is, is the, the current set of technology that we have for neuroscience going to force us to, um, basically is it gonna force us to wait? Uh, I mean, we can do a little bit of this EG hyperscanning um, and a certain amount of fMRI hyperscanning is possible now. But um, in order to get people properly socially interacting, and particularly where bodily interaction becomes possible and, and um, the, the full range of um, embodied cues and coordination becomes possible, are we, are we basically just forced to wait on the development of technology before we can do an active neuroscience? Um. No, I, I th well, I think both. In a way, we have to wait, but on, in another way, I think there are so many interesting things. You know, I, I, when I was uh, in Helsinki, not this time, but before I was, in, I was there, I think in 2013, and I went to visit several of their labs, and I'm, I was so um, amazed by how they were basically MacGyvering uh, different kinds of uh, ways to, to investigate um, aspects of this. So. In a way, I think we have to wait, but the innovations are happening. And one thing that I, that was happening there, for instance, was um, they were putting two people in an fMRI scanner uh, at the same time, which is very difficult to do because it's, you know, the space is very small. And Sorry, then into the same scanner? Into the same scanner, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. 
and they, so they had to have two head coils and um, the people were lying like this so if my hands are their heads um, they were with their heads in front of each other more or less like this actually because and so that meant that they had to look at each other you know like this because the other person was basically above them and then uh, touching each other's hands and then they measured um, yeah correlations with brain activity while people were doing that so um, and I th yeah, it was so nice to see how, how steps are being taken in that way, you know, inventing things on, on, the, on the fly, if you like. Um, and there's also um, the, so there's also, for instance, the human dynamic clamp research of Guillaume Dumas and um, Scott Kelso, and I don't know who the other co-author is. Um, but, and this is a methodology for, for measuring um, uh, or, or for, for controlling parameters and in interaction. And in a way it's done with a, a model and a human, but the model can be um, uh, adapted in such a way that you can still look at aspects of interaction, even if it's not a live interaction. So uh, yeah, it's all, you know, small steps, I think, but they're going in, in this direction. And, and I think there's a lot of enthusiasm also from people who don't come from inaction to to start investigating interactions in, in these ways that are much more close to naturalistic situations. And so there's waiting and at the same time that there are really exciting things happening already. That's great. So we've had a, a couple of questions come in from Agnes Henson. I'm not sure if you uh, mess over to the left-hand side of your screen, Hannah, if the Q&A app isn't active for you. Um, can you see the questions? I can read them if needs be. Uh, Oh yeah, so maybe the first one, ah yes. Do you believe that this attempt to redefine cognition is the biggest barrier to people engaging with these ideas? Um, um, the coupling constitution fallacy. Um, if I could comment just quickly on Agnes's question, actually, because it, it, um, I was at a, a, a seminar a little while ago, um, well, it was back some time ago now, in which the psychologist um, Ezekiel Morsella was there, and he pointed out that for an awful lot of science, the issue of definitions isn't actually that big a problem, um, so long as we can manage um, indexing or identification. So I might not be able to define cognition, but if I can point to it and sort of recognize it when it happens, I can still study it. And the definitions, scientific definitions, tend to come after the fact. Um, you know, we, we've studied, we studied water long before we knew it was H2O. And we learned an awful lot about water, so long as we could agree on when it was water and when it wasn't. So um, I guess there is a question of as to whether um, that kind of thing can happen with something as difficult to point to directly as cognition. Hmm. That we can study it while we still don't know exactly what it is. Of course, while we're studying it, we get to know better what it is, right? Mm. In a way. Although, of course, that has to be constrained also. You cannot, you know, yeah. You have to have some principles, even if you don't have a full definition. You have to have some principles to look at it that kind of hang together, because otherwise uh, you cannot draw uh, next steps in your argumentation that make sense. Um, but the coupling constitution fallacy, I have... Uh, kind of out of my head what that debate is about. I, I suspect that has a lot to do with, um, uh, oh, his, his name's gone out of my head, but whether the idea of if um, is cognition something that happened is constituted by the interaction, or if mm -hmm. it, you just have two coupled cognitive systems and that they're coupled to one another, but they don't constitute the cognitive process itself. But um, the coupling isn't, isn't what is constitutive either. I mean, this is an, a, a thing that uh, um, people ask us often, and actually it's a bit frustrating because we don't say that the coupling constitutes cognition. What constitutes cognition is the subjects who are engaging with their world, who are interacting with their world, and of course interaction is a fundamental part of it, but the other fundamental part is the subject 
and who comes with their history, with their embodiment, with their... Um, so saying that the, that the coupling constitutes the, the cognition and that that's the complete answer is not what we are saying. Okay. Mm. Um, so um, maybe if we have a, a quick look at Agnes' second question and then we, we might leave it at that. I think it's uh, really an extension or uh, a sort of preemptive rejoinder to um, the, the first question there. Um, and that is the issue of, um, do we think people would be more receptive if we got, I suppose, sidestep definitional issues and focus instead specifically on behavior in this instance? Well, I suspect in, if, we're, if we're focusing on behavior, we're not necessarily some, saying anything particular about the, how, the agents of, uh, how the agents are constituted. No, and nor are we saying something about uh well behavior what, what is behavior then does it include everything or not like like ralph said behavior is only one aspect of cognition there's no consciousness there but in an active sense you couldn't separate those you couldn't separate consciousness and behavior uh at, when you want to talk about cognition like that um okay um, well, maybe just Jim Hanlon joined in there. Just one last, maybe if we have a just a one minute response to the this yeah. uh, a final question. Yeah. Um, Any differences I see between biologically evolved social causal influence and culturally evolved social interaction? Near behavioristic social behaviors and communicative interactions. Um, Again, I would find it difficult to speak about mere behavioristic social behavior. So maybe then he, he means uh, animal behavior, but many social animals already are, are also in a community, but of course, different from a human com community. But um, um, I think we have to study the relations between those things and for each species particularly, right, for humans, mm. sociology is, is a really enormous uh, and important part of, of what we're studying here, sociology and social psychology. So, yeah, we are, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I, I suspect that inaction would, like so many things, um, yeah. resist the, the distinction there to a certain extent, but. Yeah. Um, you, although there again you have to then you, you cannot just say which was one of ralph's uh, questions about our work too then if you put everything together how do you study it again because if mm. it's all together then we we have no way of entering into it so but an action also makes um inroads into the subject uh, into into the topic of cognition and social cognition in particular ways but along different dividing lines than traditional cognitivism and individualism or <laughs> yeah. so. Very good. Thank you. Well, on that a rather expansive and uh, challenging note, I think, um, but also an optim optimistic one. Um, I think maybe we'll we'll leave it here. We'll um, thank you, uh, Hannah, for sticking with us and uh, enduring the the prolonged run in as we dealt with the technical issues. Um, and thank you to the audience as well, um, also for your patience and for. Um, engaging with the, um, we we uh, we might still have a couple of things to iron out on the the Q and A app front and other possibilities, um, but we'll uh, uh, we'll we'll address those at another time. So thanks again, Hannah. Um, next month's Enso seminar will um, be by um, Eric Charles at American University, and that will be the first Thursday in March. Is also the fourth. Is the third of March. So on the uh, at, at 2 p.m. UTC on the 3rd of March, we'll be hearing from Eric. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Thanks again, Hannah. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.